on October 16, 2020, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine presented an all-staff special lecture featuring Dr. Roderick Pettigrew. The title of Dr. Pettigrew's talk was Engineering Better Medicine for Public Health Crises and the Future. Dr. Al Romig, Executive Officer for the National Academy of Engineering, served as MC for the event. Good morning, everyone. My name is Al Romig, Executive Officer of the National Academy of Engineering. Today, I am delighted to introduce my very good friend, Rod Pettigrew, who is a member of both the NAE and the NAM. Rod, thank you so much for being willing to do this lecture for us today. Just a little bit for everyone about Rod's background. Um, he's the Robert A. Welsh Professor of Medicine and serves as CEO of Engineering Health and is the Executive Dean for Engineering Medicine at Texas A&M and the Houston Methodist Hospital. He was the founding director of the U.S. National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering of the NIH. Among his many honors, he has received the NAE Arthur M. Bika Award. And most recently, literally within the last few days, he was awarded the Vannevar Bush Award from the National Science Board for Public Service and R&D in Biomedical Engineering. So we'll have some comments from John Anderson and Victor Zhao, presidents of the uh, Engineering and Medicine Academies, respectively, who will share their reflections, and then we'll have a brief conversation with Rod. So over to you, Rod. Well, good morning, everybody. I, I am uh, truly uh, quite honored to have been invited to speak to you, uh, the staff of both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, and to speak on a topic of great timeliness and of global importance. Uh, it is my pleasure to be hosted by and share the virtual stage with the two esteemed leaders of our academies, uh, John Anderson and Victor Zhao, uh, both of whom I am happy to call friends. I also want to thank Al Romick and, and Guru Madhavan, who suggested this special lecture following the publication of my commentary on a similar uh, topic uh, in the National Academy of Medicine's website and, uh, and also posted on the National Academy of Engineering's website as well. So today I would like to talk to you about the public health crises that we are currently battling and how a convergence of engineering and medicine on a national scale can help address these challenges. The crisis of which I speak, we are all aware of. The medical crisis, the novel coronavirus pandemic, the economic crisis, a derivative of the pandemic, and social justice and equity of which health is a key component. Now, every generation faces its own challenging experiences, but arguably living as we are through these three crises is truly remarkable. Indeed, during our lifetimes with perhaps the possible exception of nonagenarians, we have not faced such multiple intertwined crises of this magnitude and scope. The battle with COVID-19 is indeed on several fronts involving not just a novel virus, but also inadequacies in the nation's medical system, the disproportionate impact on communities of color and the devastation to our economy, as well as the impact that this is having on our educational institutions. So to uh, prevail and also to better prepare for the next attack, COVID-20X, of course, our nation needs to follow the science that leads to practical solutions. But our greatest opportunity to affect lasting transformation 
is to bring engineers, physicians, and medical scientists together in a merger of engineering and medicine to build effective healthcare solutions. This is consistent with the 14 grand challenges of the National Academies of Engineering. And one of those grand challenges is engineering better medicines, which aligns with our topic today. In addition, the National Academy of Engineering has issued this COVID-19 call for engineering action, noting that while this pandemic physically separates us, it also compels us to work together to address the challenges that we're facing or the three classes of challenges that I just uh, talked about. In fact, John Anderson has characterized engineers as having bold and creative ideas, pursuing comprehensive solutions. That's what engineers do. We take the systematic approach uh, to grand uh, challenges. And indeed, uh, Victor Zhao has, as I can personally attest, recognized and actively embraced the natural symbiosis between medicine and engineering. And in fact, I've learned that he too now is an engineer. The National Academy of Medicine, uh, this time last year, announced the Healthy Longevity Global Competition. Uh, this is a competition that asks our best and brightest scientists and engineers to innovate and put forward creative ideas that would extend the human health span. And I love that term health span. It's a lifespan with great health. Uh, in fact, this is a competition that will unfold over the next five years in three phases. The first phase called a catalyst phase over the next couple of years had 150 awards announced just yesterday. And of those 150 awards, 21 came from the US, the others from 50 countries, uh, totaling some $30 million or so that's been raised to support this competition over this period. The final prize at the end of five years is a $4 million prize, one or more of those. But among the 21 Catalyst Award winners from the US, as is the case for the award winners from the other countries. Many of them involve technology and engineering innovations integrated to help achieve the goal of healthy longevity. Here are six examples from among the 26 US Catalyst Award winners. An implantable continuous hemodialysis device as an example of this convergence of engineering and medicine. Nanocatalysis, which uh, may be a new term for you, but this involves nanoparticles made from metals, which have the effect of catalyzing desired chemical reactions in the body. Skin barrier re restoration to halt chronic inflammation in the body called inflammogen. Artificial intelligence and deep learning approaches, a system to monitor daily, daily vital signs, more important than you might expect and think to facilitate a long and healthy life. And one of particular interest innovation here is the development of an avatar of a younger version of yourself. This not only involves engineering, and medicine, but behavioral science as well. And there's evidence to suggest that this might indeed have the de desired effect of extending one's health. So what I am envisioning and positing here is a deeper integration of our disciplines, integrating physicians and engineers to create a new kind of healthcare professional 
a physician ear, as we call them at our institution. And the physician ear is a trained person who understands the natural interwoven nature of the physical sciences, the biological sciences, and engineering. They are not separated in human biology. They are not separated in nature. In fact, life would not exist without all of them being seamlessly interwoven. So it makes sense that the most efficient route to effective solutions would come from this kind of, a, of approach, both in the research arenas and also how we practice medicine. This concept was posited by several of us five years ago, where we talked about the integration of engineering into medicine and medicine into engineering until boundaries vanish as a critical step to achieve these goals that we have of delivering higher quality healthcare uh, globally uh, and doing it in such a way as to maintain costs these are goals which often go in opposite directions, but technological innovation involving the interface and the interplay of engineering and medicine can help us get there. We are purposely pursuing this concept and this paradigm at our institution in our medical school program that we call NMED, which stands for engineering medicine where we're training physician ears, the problem-solving minded, innovation-oriented, invention-minded healthcare professionals, as outlined here, who will perform research across all biological scales and innovations across these, from molecules to whole organ uh, systems and organs, as you see here, and delivering these into the clinical arena where they will have a positive impact on healthcare and advance the delivery of healthcare. What you might not appreciate, for example, as an exemplar of innovation is this is not only a beautiful appearing prosthetic left hand complete with the wedding band, but is also controlled by this individual when this individual thinks, just as the natural hand does. These are the types of innovations that are needed to help us navigate our way through this confluence of crises consequent to COVID and to better prepare us for the future. Now, many, if not most of us, know someone with COVID. For me, this happened early on during the pandemic. And that person was my brother. When I first learned that he had COVID, I was frightened. In fact, I was understatement because as a child, he had asthma. And I envisioned that that would lead him to this situation being intubated in an intensive care unit. He described his asthma when we were kids in a way that I still remember. He said during his asthma attacks that when he was trying to take a breath, it was as if there was a chain around his chest and just would not allow it to expand. This a description of air hunger, this kind of problem and these kinds of challenges have been an accelerator of convergence of medicine and engineering to try and develop approaches to help the healthcare profession deal with these challenges. And in fact, on the right side of the screen, here is a list of the needs that the healthcare system was faced with consequent to COVID, where engineering has indeed play and continues to play a critical role. For a beautiful and complete description of this in great detail, I refer you to the presentation that was given by David Walt 
uh, at the beginning of the National Academy of Engineering an annual meeting uh, just a, a week ago. So I would uh, submit that a silver lining in the COVID cloud has been the emergence of convergence, bringing these disciplines together. In fact, the prescient statement by Gary Taubes 18 years ago now, when he observed that biology and engineering were beginning to cross paths then, and indeed they have. But observing that at their intersection could become remarkable advances in the understanding and treatment of disease, this statement was in evidence this month also when the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded. This particular prize for chemistry highlighted the discovery by Charpentier and Doudna, who made this discovery by following and observing what happened in nature, observing that bacteria had a defense mechanism. When they were invaded by viruses, they had this system that would track down the viral DNA and along with the tracking system, now called CRISPR, carry along with it a type of genetic scissors uh, that would cut the DNA of the infected virus and learn how to use this to provide us with a powerful genetic engineering tool so that we can edit genes therapeutically. Similarly, Jim Collins, also a member of the NAE and NAM, has modified this, uh, Jim is from the Wies Institute as you can see there, to develop what I would call a smart mask. This mask not only shields the neighbor from the wearer, if the wearer happens to have COVID, but it will also detect the COVID virus and do so rapidly. So under development, the workings, the inner workings are illustrated here. The mass material has multiple layers. Within those multiple layers are these three-stage process, process you see here. The lysis of the virus, the uh, amplification of the nucleic acids, and then using this uh, CRISPR technology, albeit with a different set of scissors, but the one that the Nobel Prize was awarded for used the Cas9 protein enzyme as a set of scissors. And this implementation, it uses a different set of scissors, but a similar concept, the Cas13 scissors. And so doing, those scissors actually liberate a reporter molecule, which uh, happens when the tracking system, the CASPER system, identifies the COVID-19 virus. It releases this reporter. The reporter molecule is colored. Uh, this travels to the outer surface of the mask and is collected there by antibodies at a specific location and it changes color. This is like the home pregnancy test. You get an immediate indication as you can see in one to two hours. Quite a clever idea from the convergence of engineering, biology, and medicine. Now, let's turn to health inequities, which have been dramatically highlighted by COVID and the pandemic. This data is from the CDC. It shows a dramatically higher hospitalization rate for black and brown persons. Four to five times higher, in, in fact and also a higher level of death. This data, however, regarding death is not adjusted for age, but when you adjust for age as was done in this particular graphic, there is similarly 
an unacceptably higher death rate for black and brown persons, 50% higher for Asians and two to almost four times higher for uh, people of color as shown here. This constitutes a social crisis. And in addition to that, we now appreciate that where one lives is important and in fact, a strong determinant of your lifespan, your life expectancy, leading to many discussions and articles being written that identify and raise the question of the importance of the zip code and perhaps being more significant than one's genetic code in determining how long you live. Right here, where most of you are in the metropolitan DC area, you can see that if you live in DC, you're born and live in DC, that one's life expectancy is six to seven years less than immediately adjacent and neighboring communities to the West, uh, Montgomery County, Fairfax County. Here's where Potomac and Bethesda, Bethesda is where I live, substantially lower. This differential is even greater in the city of Boston. If you live and born in Roxbury, your life expectancy is 30 years less than being born and lived in the Back Bay community. This comes at substantial cost. The economics of health inequities is highlighted here. The cost to our system of $126 billion this year due to lost pro productivity in addition to added cost to provide adequate health care. And if left unchecked in 30 years, this will more than triple as shown. Chris Murray, who has been quite prevalent in the news during the pandemic, he's the director of the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation, where they have provided the estimations of the level of infections and deaths going forward, has cited racism as a public health issue. So the question that I have as a result of, of observing all of this is that given that this issue is systemic and often not overt, can we engineer functional guardrails into our healthcare and delivery system? Can we engineer checkpoints, feedback, so that one gets the same standard of healthcare independent of your zip code, independent of your socioeconomic level? For the remainder of the talk, I have three brief examples of how this convergence of the physical sciences, the life sciences and engineering, which I'm calling convergence engineering, might in fact be used to help bridge the social divide that has just been illustrated. Developing technologies and information and communication systems that might help democratize the delivery of these remarkable advances that we've all generated and appreciate. The coronavirus is with us. We are all anxiously awaiting a vaccine, but the question also is how will we distribute that vaccine? How will we make sure that individuals will get the vaccine independent of the zip code? One possibility is illustrated in this video that I'm about to show you that demonstrates an emerging advance in technology resulted from the work led by Mark Prosnitz, a bioengineer at Georgia Tech and his medical colleagues at Emory to develop a system that promises to allow at home self-administering of the vaccine. And not only that, having this mail to you potentially. Imagine that one day you could go to your mailbox and in the mail, you get 
a Band-Aid and essentially take this Band-Aid in the house from your doctor, place it on your arm, and you're vaccinated. Vaccinated against the flu, so you got your flu shot for the season, or vaccinated against a dreaded virus, or vaccinated against cancer. That kind of innovation occurred between the merger of immunology from the biologists and materials engineering from the engineer. These two people coming together to solve this unmet need. So in InMed, we're going to train physicians to think like that. We will train physicians to see a medical process such as we really have difficulty in vaccinating the nation. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could vaccinate themselves? Wouldn't it be great if you could go to the drugstore and pick up your vaccine? So that sort of thinking, that sort of transformational thinking is what InMed is all about. So another um, innovation that could be very helpful would be to challenge our most creative scientists in our fields to work together to imagine developing digital tracking systems that will similarly improve healthcare, support systems in the clinic, routine standard of care checks and reminders, uh, further acceleration of telehealth, for example, taking advantage of the environmental monitors that are about and the, and the monitoring systems that we have, and certainly uh, accelerating the use and utility of wearables to provide passive monitors of health indices. We have but to look at how this uh, conference is being held now, how this uh, presentation is being held now, uh, to appreciate how engineering, when done purposefully, can really be transformative. We would not have predicted just 10 months ago that on a population level, we would be able to routinely get together and interact with each other the way that we do now consequent to Zoom. Even though we had this sort of basic technology a decade ago in the form of Skype, the COVID process has really accelerated to a status and to a level of development that it has enhanced utility, uh, making it uh, beneficial to meet the needs that we have. This is an example of what might be achieved if with purposeful attention, we, we look to the social challenges that we have now and look for ways that engineering can come together with our social scientists, our biological and medical sciences to help us bridge the social divide and address some of the challenges that were just illustrated in delivering healthcare independent of where you live in terms of the quality. So the final example that I'd like to give is one that points to one of the major causes of death and disability across this globe, and that is hypertension. It is highly prevalent, yet even though it is highly prevalent, uh, half of the time in individuals that have it is under control. And in fact, many individuals that have it don't know that they have it. And as a result, it's quite expensive. The economic burden that hypertension brings is substantial. So what if we had a technology that was able to monitor the hypertension passively so that this graphic shown here where half of the people don't have adequate control of their hypertension, get better feedback on their hypertension and reduce the death and disability that results from this lack of information 
and is under treatment. Here is an animation of the concept I posited half a decade ago of being able to walk through a doorway, have your blood pressure measured passively, having this information sent to your cell phone. And throughout the day, this would occur. You'd get a, a feedback the next morning, looking in the mirror, having the data presented to you in the mirror as you look so you know exactly what your blood pressure is and all of the composite data, the details being sent to the physician in the bottom left screen and being available to the physician to affect a more complete management uh, and care of the hypertensive person. This concept is now beginning to be developed. Not quite the futuristic idea I have here of being able to walk through a doorway, but nonetheless, uh, devices which are uh, being produced that would allow one to measure your blood pressure without the necessity uh, of a cuff or in development. So what I would like to do now is to close using a quotation from Sir Arthur Clarke, which actually Al Romick last uh, Sunday reminded us all of. This telling quote from the futurist who was actually the author of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and noting that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And as we know this, we can look to history to both illustrate and inspire us with this uh, illustration. About 144 years ago, actually I would say exactly 144 years ago, the telephone was so indistinguishable from magic that Western Union did not take it seriously. But on the other hand, and the other end of the spectrum, someone at Radio News in 1924, years before the invention of the TV, conceived of and illustrated telehealth. Look at it in this Radio News cover from 1924, almost 100 years ago. I think this is amazing. The young lad is sitting here with this holding his tongue out so that a doctor can see him as a stethoscope. He's watching the doctor watching him. There's a printout of his data, the camera at the top of this fictional TV screen, a yet to be invented, amazing and inspiring. Through a deep convergence of medical science and engineering, I would posit visions like this can become reality, as this one certainly has. I close with something from John Book's uh, Slaughter, who in his remarkable address to the NAE last week, quoted the past president of the ASWE, Stephanie Farrell. In this address on racial justice, and the lack of equity, he cited President Farrell as observing that diversity is about counting heads. Equity is about making heads count. That is what we can do. That is what we should do. Innovations that help achieve this goal will in turn help the planet and the goal that we all have for ourselves, that of enjoying healthy longevity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rod. That was, uh, wow, that's all I can say. Um, and I'd like to make a few comments and then turn it over to, to Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, of course, hearing of engineering is important in medicine is music to my ears and uh -huh. the idea of bold and, and creative, you, your slides certainly had that. Uh, 
so uh, your message came through. You know, I have three slides that I really enjoyed uh, the most. One was um, the integral slide. You got an integral sign in there, which shows your physics background a little bit, right? Uh, in there. And, uh, and with medicine for a physician ear, which we know that is Victor Zal is one of those. So we, we have that. Uh, and he sec is. Secondly, the diagnostic mass just blew me away. I'm mean, thinking about that. That was kind of a futuristic thing, like the young lad 100 years ago looking at the computer and you say, that's not possible. But yeah, it is. And uh, that was incredible. And the, la the last point I want to make about it is the avatar of her younger self. My only comment here is I hope you hurry up. <laughs> uh, to help us, okay? Because some of us, some of us have a timetable a little different than others, and uh, I like that idea of avatar of our younger self. Um, and on the serious side, the variation of life expectancy by zip code and race is sobering. That was, I hadn't seen those uh, the data before. Uh, your work on the, any committee on racial justice and equity, newly formed committee, might lead to engineering-inspired mitigation of these racial and inequities, as you pointed out, uh, things that we can do and, uh, and um, injustices. So uh, fortunately, we're fortunate to have you as a member of that committee. Of course, you have both a PhD and an MD, and you got the, P the PhD first uh, and then the MD. You are the architect and first director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioimaging at the NIH. But on the human side, you had to overcome so many obstacles within society as a young black man in the South uh, to become as accomplished as you are. There aren't many people like you, so we can't expect the average person or even the somewhat talented person to do that. Uh, so there much has to be done. You're a pioneer. But uh, your situation also highlights the importance of historically black colleges and universities in the education of black men and women, because Morehouse College gave you a solid education and a launch to a spectacular career. And we should never forget that and the, and the role that they have played and will, and, uh, will con continue to play. I was very moved by your essay that appeared in the NAE publication, The Bridge, and that wonderful photo with you and the late Congressman, uh, civil rights pioneer, John, John Lewis. That's a, that's a treasure uh, to behold and uh, wonderful photo. And finally, uh, before, I thank you for your volunteer work for the National Academies, uh, especially your recent activity on the NEE call to action to fight COVID-19, and of course, your webinar today. So Rod, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Victor for a few remarks. Rod, that was a tour de force. It's truly inspiring. When you bring together the pieces that sometimes we take for granted, but in fact, what you're showing is the ability to bring together great minds, great technology for the service of the nation and our public. It's, it's phenomenal. I, I agree with John. First of all, you, I think you're a role model for many of us. And you're certainly a role model for people in the minority world where people seeing that can it be done? And you've done that. You're a visionary. It's very obvious, and the creation of New School EdMed is a great example of what you believe in and trying to bring your, the worlds together. You're a leader, and of course, you're a physician engineer. I love the word physicianeer and imagineer. And I started thinking about all the nears I can add, add at the end of all this stuff. So it's wonderful. Um, so let me say first, thank you for your great service to both academies. And in this effort today, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, certainly, you've done so much for NAM. We're very proud of you. We're proud of many successes, including the up and coming Whenever Bush Award. But I think your contribution to the grand challenge, as you demonstrated in the health longevity, highlighting so much of the things that you can do in understanding medicine, understand the needs of the patient, then bringing the engineering is, I think that's unique. And that's probably why you started the school because I think we live in different worlds. <laughs> we live in a world of practice and we live in a world of, um, in, in, shall we say, science. 
And the bringing together is exactly what you're talking about, the convergence. I think the convergence of engineering medicine is not only in research, but also in healthcare management, and of course, also in the practice of medicine. And so thank you, because I have just great, enormous respect for John and L and uh, Dan Mote, and we have a friendship. In fact, uh, when I became a member of the Chinese Academy, Academy of Engineering, John and L took me out for a drink. Well, we had more than one drink. <laughs> we, we promised we're going to do that again, except COVID is not allowing us to do this. But we can find ways to do, bring your own booze Zoom event. Okay, so a few comments I want to make, and maybe this is entering into the discussion period, catalyzing. I think when you think about engineering in health and medicine, you talk about the individual, you talk about to population, but you also talk about systems and you're talking about communities. Yes. How do you use engineering technique to bring all these things together? Where we struggle mightily in medicine, as you know, highly fragmented between the research enterprise, the hospitals, the community, the population, right? Yes. And convergence science requires bring all these things together. And I would say to you that uh, engineering has a great chance of helping together because when I was a Duke, a CEO of the health system, I had, believe it or not, 70 system engineer working, how to improve our workflow, how to do things differently, and without them, and how to measure our progress. Without them, can you imagine a bunch of docs doing that? But you've enabled healthcare to be better but in many ways, we've been talking between the two academies and with some of the leadership about how to actually bring systems engineer, which I will remember back about at least 10 years ago, we had an effort between um, engineering and medicine to look at how to bring this forward. And now ever more. So, and I really like your point about racial challenges, inequity, so the question I want to ask is, in bringing all these technology forward, how do you assure access and equity? Because everybody's always worried that new technology drives up the cost. And it's only available to some section of the community. We see that even in telehealth. I live in Durham. I see this in education. Our entire public school has gone to virtual. But many of our students have no computers and no access to Wi-Fi. So how do you address in engineering the issue of equity, access cost equity, and of course, ethics and many social issues? Let me stop here because I've got lots mm -hmm. of questions to ask you about your curriculum, the specialization of NMED and others. But this may be just a good place to start to see how we can bring the two disciplines much closer together. And thank you for your leadership. Well, Victor, this is a concern that I have and have had. Uh, we've been having discussions. I've had these discussions uh, actually directly with Al Romick and we've had some discussions with uh, NAM as well about how we can target this question by bringing our two communities together to purposefully try and develop solutions that bridge the economic divide, that bridge the um, separation by zip codes. I don't think that our fields have really taken this challenge on head on where you really look at the, at the issues, the social determinants of health and try and design systems that work within, uh, that, that work within the boundary conditions that we have that result in these uh, problems. One of the things that engineers do is that they create solutions to operate 
within existing boundary conditions. And, uh, and if we were to lay out this challenge to our community, the way we already have in the call to COVID action, the way that we already have in the healthy longevity challenge, where we, where we ask our uh, best and brightest to imagine and create ways in which this could be done. Mm -hmm. That was one of the points I was trying to make. None of us individually have those answers. Right now, I can't say exactly what could be done, but I am sure that if you put this challenge out there and lay out specifically what it is you wanna have developed, what targets you need to meet, what boundary conditions this has to work in. And you bring in this current generation of Imagineers together to try and reach th this goal and this target uh, that substantially uh, advance would be made. Uh, the point of pointing to Zoom is an example. None of us ever thought just 10 months ago that we'd be Zooming all over the place. You know, Zoom to me was a, a line in a song by Aretha Franklin. She was used, she had a song mm. saying, who's Zooming who? <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was a kid show <laughs> called Zoom. You're probably too young to remember. I'll bet you John and Elle remember. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. zoom. <laughs> yeah, you got it. But you know, but Rod, I think the issue is how to make it affordable, accessible. Zoom is great. And for people like us, we don't have to leave our place and we can be safe. But I right. can tell you, and you know this, certainly is what I, what I was saying about the students who don't have access to computers, don't have access to internet, and the people who have to go and work in the front line for jobs that we don't have to do. We need to find an engineering solution for all those. Yes. So Victor, what I was saying, I was using Zoom as an example of taking something that fundamentally had already existed, but it wasn't really developed to the point that the population could use it or a substantial part of the population could use it. You know, Skype was invented over a decade ago. I think in the early 2000s, it had been around. And we had uh, some other uh, versions like that. But somebody took on this challenge and made it more developed to the point that you could use it at a population level. Now, if you look at what happened there and say, can we do something like that with this other challenge where you have people who don't have access to X, Y, and Z, they don't mm -hmm. have the money to afford this. How can, how can we include them in this whole healthcare enterprise? How can we deliver healthcare to those people as well. What is it that can, what is it that we can do? Uh, either one of us may not have those answers, but I think those answers exist within our generations coming behind us, maybe even within the generations that we have. When you bring uh, disparate minds together, creative and imaginative and surprising things often happen. And that's the whole point. You bring in folks together. And no, no doubt you've been a part of meetings where out of that meeting came some idea, some direction, some process that you didn't uh, think of when you entered the meeting. And that's what we're really talking about. Thank you. Terrific, yeah. I think we wanna turn this over. There might be some questions from the viewers. I think Al is, uh, Al Romig is to lead this. Is that right, Al? Yeah, that, that's right, John. So let me let me use the prerogative here, Rod, and I'll ask the very first question. Um, how receptive have you found other medical schools and colleges of engineering to wanting to emulate something similar to what you've done at Texas A&M? Well, there are a couple of similar programs uh, already. Uh, you may be familiar with University of Illinois at Ch Champaign-Urbana. They've created uh, a new medical college called Carl, Illinois. Uh, in a very similar vein, they are now a new uh, uh, medical school 
but a medical school that is engineering based. Uh, there is a, a program that similarly strives to develop medical innovators at Vanderbilt. Their approach is, is different. They uh, take existing PhDs in a science or a technology, uh, train them to be physicians, but focus them on learning how to become medical innovators. Their program is called the Medical Innovators Development Program. So uh, those two programs already exist. And Rice, uh, next year partnering with UT McGovern, uh, is developing a, a similar program uh, training physicians uh, to become uh, medical innovators, uh, earning uh, serially an MD and a master's in engineering. Excellent. Our program is a little different in that the curriculum is blended so that the students emerge from four years, which normally is the time that it takes to get an MD with both an MD and a master's in engineering, focusing on engineering innovation. Excellent. So we have one question from the audience so far, Rod. This is from Courtney Hill, who's a new program officer in the NAE. And it's uh, for the rapid detection COVID mass that you described, do you know what the sensitivity is? Well, I refer you to Jim Collins. He's at the Wies Institute in Boston at Harvard. Uh, this uh, is in development. I don't know if it uh, is to the point that they have data in terms of its performance, uh, but it's certainly a well-founded idea and a concept. And if it functions the way uh, uh, pregnancy tests do, uh, one would expect it to be uh, reasonably uh, sensitive. I don't really know. So I can't uh, answer with any sort of numbers or figures, but I'm sure Jim Collins would be delighted to tell you where they stand now. They've so, been so working you, on this for a while. So you made a comment about the mail to your home vaccination program. What about for testing? You know, for example, if there was some rapid, easy way to do an antibody study on yourself and you found out, you know, it, it seems, although there may be a few documented cases of reinfection, it's certainly very rare that if you were someone who's already had it, didn't know it and carry antibodies uh, to COVID, you might say, well, I'm gonna go to the phase four and save the vaccine for people who don't have natural protection. What about, what about at-home testing? Where do you see that for things like antibodies and viruses and so forth? Well, you know, at-home testing again has been uh, a, a long held dream that I personally had um, even before COVID. Uh, back when I was at the NIH, we were uh, we had a point of care task force in conjunction with the Gates Foundation, and this was one of the goals that we, we had, which was to develop at home tests. Even for garden variety influenza, it would be a fantastic advance. COVID has really shown the spotlight on this uh, and heightened. Uh, our desire and interest to have these at-home diagnostics. But Al, I think that's really where we're headed. That's where the money is. Just think of all of the savings in multiple uh, sectors that you could have if you were able to identify right at home whether you do or you don't. You wouldn't have to go to the hospital. You wouldn't have uh, collateral uh, issues about other persons around you becoming uh, in, infected, uh, you would know when you're uh, cleared of it. You could even have feedback if you were connected to the digital communication system to the whole system that surrounds it. You'd have a sense of how much uh, vaccine, uh, how, how much uh, therapeutic you would need for somebody who uh, was, uh, for the number of people that were positive. Um, it, would, it would be transformative. So I think at-home diagnostics uh, is, a, a, is a goal to have and would be tremendously impactful. Great, thank you. See, we're at our end time, but why don't I have a turn it over and if John or Victor have any final questions or comments, and then we'll, we'll call it a, a meeting. Thank you, Rod. Uh, Victor and John. John, you go Victor. first. Well, I just want to thank, thank Rod again. He's a great example of uh, uh, 
persistence and uh, uh, overcoming uh, obstacles and uh, really, really doing spectacular things for society. And he's also very interdisciplinary. I like, really like the idea of bringing things together as he's spoken. And um, I hope there are many disciples of Rod Pettigrew. We need some more people like this as they come along. And uh, as he said, then maybe the current generation, the next generation will uh, come up with things that make, make our lives a lot better. Thank you, Rod. Look forward to working with you in the future on many, many things. Victor? Thank you so, both. Rod, Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, I missed the uh, opening of your school. I was very much wanted to be there, but th those days we're still traveling. And you can imagine I was in some part of the world that I wasn't able to come to it. I look forward to meeting your physician needs from your medical school or NMED. Uh, I've always wondered why not med engineering, but that's, <laughs> you can go either way. But I can see exactly what the thinking behind is and the generations of people that you will produce will be quite phenomenal and will make a difference. Now, you know, in many ways uh, through you, through Guru, now who's the program, chief program officer engineering coming from medicine, we are so much more connected. And I look forward to working with John and Al, both, both academies and with your leadership to uh, really do a lot of things together. I think this is just the beginning of an example of many things we can do. You also gave me lots of great ideas actually, quite frankly, on the issue of health equity. What can engineers and health community work together, health equity? That is a grand challenge. That is a grand challenge. And I think you, uh, and I think that getting a group of people together to tackle that and begin to ideate, to imagine solutions to these problems. You know, right now, if we try to solve it, you know, the mind sort of boggles, but we know from history that if you get people together in a room and they interact with each other, often from that interaction will emerge some practical solutions. We must remember too that no matter how complex or big, the challenge, the first step's important. Once you make the first step, you keep going. You can't say, you can't solve it all at once you start working your way towards a solution. And I think that's hey, a great point. I agree with everything you said, except we're not in a room. You get everybody to get in the Zoom, you mean. <laughs> not <in a> room. <laughs> so so we, do, we do have one final question, and we'll end with that. One final question from Reginald Hayes, NAM. Hi there. Uh, actually, I'm um, NAS, but it's oh, okay. okay. All, all love. Um, We're all one family. Yes, indeed. I actually direct the roundtable on black men and black women in science, engineering and medicine. And this is precisely what we do in our webinars and our forums and our discussions and all of the things that, that we talk about that are issues that plague not just the numbers of, of decline in all of those disciplines, but also the systemic issues that have prevented any kind of progress or any kind of cohesive involvement of, of really finding uh, a plan of action to, to chart the course so that the community begins to trend in a, um, an upward number. So this is precisely what we do. And Dr. Pettigrew actually was a speaker in our last, in our last uh, workshop on educational pathways and barriers that, that we presented in the first week of September. So I wanted to notify that there is something like that in the academies and Dr. Pettigrew you, you are an active participant with that group, along with Dr. Holton. Thank you for hey, sharing Reggie, that. Let me say a word. You're not NAS, you are NASEM. That is, that is very true. Yeah, <laughs> as we all there's are. always a <laughs> confusion in that. Re yeah. Reginald, you, re you, have to, you have to remember the other two letters. Well, <laughs> I, I officially have an NAS email, so I always say that I'm NAS, but I, I think, so yes, I. our group is the most multidisciplined yeah, we are the most disciplined because we literally have everyone represented and we, we equally fight for all of the, for all hey, of the. Hey, 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 hey. Okay. 
So, Victor, so Ryan, should we should we change it? Should we change it to an NASCM email designation? That would be actually more productive because it, it covers all the dots. And <laughs> I don't have to juggle. We won't be able to get the domain name, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> we'll so, bring it up with Marsha. We'll bring it up with Marsha today. How's that? So Rod, Rod, this was a really wonderful talk, and I believe that uh, this will go up on the YouTube channel. Uh, and as soon as it's yeah. up on YouTube, I'm going to ask Darul to send that link to all everyone who's online here and all the staff that are in NA, uh, NAE and NAM so that they might share it with friends and relatives. I think it was a wonderful talk, and I'm sure that we uh, we all had many friends and relatives who would be very much delighted in order to uh, to, to listen to this. Thank you.